Hi, I'm Dr. Jean Faroui, and today we're talking about supporting learners who have auditory impairments. So we spoke previously about the structure and the function of the ear and how it converts sound into something that we make meaning from in our brains. And then we spoke about various different impairments and the difficulties that children can have with hearing. And we had a look at the different types of hearing impairments. Today, we're going to have a look at how to support these learners. What is it that we can do in order to assist learners with language, communication difficulties, um, with sign language? Um, what, is, what are the options, the educational options and the assessment accommodations that can be made for these learners? Now, um, I want to start by looking at the conceptual and operational guidelines. Now, these are the guidelines that the Department of Education has issued, and they acknowledge that all learners, regardless of their impairment, whether they have a hearing impairment or some other kind of impairment, should be assisted and should be helped in schools. So either in full service schools or in special schools. So the rest of the, um, the slides, I'm going to have a look in more detail at particularly what we can do as educators to support learners who have learning, um, who have hearing problems. So the very first thing that happens once a diagnosis has occurred is that the child needs to have a treatment plan. And this is what will happen in conjunction with the medical doctors and um, audiologists and ENT, a specialist doctor who looks at hearing problems. So the child will be fitted with a hearing aid and this will depend on the type and the severity of the hearing loss that they have but in general there are two types of hearing aids there are hearing aids that can be fitted behind the ear or inside the ear and these are usually for mild or moderate sensory neural losses we also um, have uh, it with our modern medical um, treatments that, that are available, there is also the option of a cochlear implant. And this is an implant that goes directly into the inner ear where the cochlea sits. And this is usually for children who have profound and severe sensory neural loss. Then there is an, an amplification uh, device called a bone conduction hearing device, which can be fitted if the child has conductive hearing loss. That is loss that has, um, there's some difficulty with the outer and the middle ear, and then it passes that and sends the sound vibrations directly to the cochlea in the middle ear. So the, um, the, the treatments that are available that will be given to children who are diagnosed with hearing loss will depend on the type of loss and the severity of the loss and also um, how much uh, people can afford to buy for these, these pieces of equipment because hearing aids are relatively expensive and a cochlear implant is a surgical operation that does require um, very careful medical attention. So for us as educators, we need to be aware that there might be learners with different types of assistive devices, amp amplifi amplification devices uh, in our classrooms. 
So when parents know that their child has a hearing impairment, and usually this will be diagnosed early on in life, um, parents have some uh, very big decisions that they need to make. And we know from statistics that over 90% of children who are born hard of hearing or deaf are born to parents who are hearing parents. So they are not parents who um, are signing as their communication system. And so the parents need to make a decision as to what the language of communication will be that they will be speaking and teaching their child. And they also need to consider all the educational options and the methods of teaching that are available for children who are deaf and where they can be accommodated best in what different type of schools. So there are lots of different websites that parents can go to. And I've given you uh, one website there called Raising Deaf Kids. And this is a site that might assist parents to help them with making these kinds of decisions. So generally, the communication decisions that need to be made range from what's called the oral or spoken language on the one end of a spectrum um, to the other end, which is purely sign language. So the language of communication is signed, whereas on the oral side of the spectrum, the language is spoken and oral language. And we're going to go through these five different types of communication methods that are available because we will find a variety of them in the different schools, in special needs schools, in full service schools, and in the learners that we will be um, that we will be teaching. So, in the oral approach, this is the approach where um, the child is taught the language of their parents, which is English or whichever home language the parents speak, and what happens here is that um, if, if it is a, a full oral approach, there is a prohibition of signing and gesturing. So the goal is the normalization of the deaf child into a world, into the world of speaking and hearing adults and, and people. What often happens though with these children is because they can't hear uh, everyday conversation around them, uh, they can only speak when they are, um, they, they can only understand when they are lip reading um, and they need to be very um, aware of looking at someone's face and gestures and facial expressions. So what often happens with these children is that they become isolated from the hearing world, and if they have also not learned the, the sign, then they're also isolated from the, the deaf, the world of, of uh, deaf people who are signing. So um, this does not mean that uh, the, the, this is a, a, a negative approach. Um, the ability to be able to lip read is a very important skill and it's a skill that is taught to people who have also lost their hearing abilities as, as their age and so um, being able to lip read for the elderly, people whose hearing deteriorates or who have had some trauma to their ears, this becomes a, a, a viable option for communication. So there is a, an online course that one can do, and I've given you the website address there called lipreading.org. And of course, you could give this to any person who is um, uh, having difficulty 
with their hearing. Um, so particularly people who have acquired their hearing loss later in life, this is an option for them. So lip reading is not just about reading the actual um, movements of your lips and your mouth and your teeth and your tongue. It is about interpreting all the information that is given provided from facial expressions and body language and gestures. And all of this is done in conjunction with the, uh, the shape of the mouth and the lips that the person is speaking. So it's um, quite a complicated thing. It is not an easy thing to master. And it does require um, quite a lot of skill and practice in interpreting all the information that somebody is giving with, when they are speaking and gesturing. Uh, and so um, often people will only get um, a few of the words and they will have difficulty understanding all of the words that are available in, um, um, in that particular converse conversation. So that is the, the, the one extreme of the communication methods. Then on the other side of the, the communication is sign language. And sign language is the um, ability to be able to use signs with your hands. And the particular signs all have a meaning and this will often, for a child who is deaf, it will often be their first or their primary means of communication. It is the, um, the language that the family and the child will learn as the infant grows. And for children who've been diagnosed early on, there um, are uh, facilities available, there are people available who will teach the family and the children how to sign. So signing is a, an, an integral language of the deaf culture. Now, when we speak of the deaf culture, um, and then we use a capital D for deaf, we are speaking about a group of people who all have the same language and they are speaking sign um, and this creates its own culture, its own jokes, its own, it, the language has its own nuances and its own um, jo um, jokes and, and everything about it makes it a unique um, group of people that someone who is signing will belong to. So, for these children who are signing, the uh, language such as English or whichever indigenous language they're speaking, that becomes a second language and they will use that second language for their writing abilities. So sign itself is a, um, a language all of it on its own. It has its own, um, it has its own expressions and its own nuances. So the, um, in South Africa, children are being taught South African Sign Language, S-A-S-L, South African Sign Language. And we know that this is now recognized as an official language and the Department of Education's conceptual and operational guidelines for inclusive education allow children now to use this as their first language when they are um, doing their final examinations. So uh, this, this particular language, remember it has its own syntax, its own word order, and so the, the grammatical structure of this language is unique. There are different sign languages across the world. So in different places, they have 
similar but different signs and they might do them in different orders. So um, signing and, for instance, English do not have a one-to-one -one relationship with each other. So you cannot um, do a, a, a direct, well, uh, one does more or less, you, you get the meaning across, but you can't do an absolute direct translation from word for word from um, one spoken language to a sign language because there might be more than one word to represent a sign and um, a sign might um, encompass a whole phrase of words. So sign is um, quite uh, a complex and abstract language and it is capable of what one is capable of expressing any um, subtlety and complexity of the human experience in this in this language. So they can tell jokes and have sarcasm and their idioms and poetry and all sorts of um, doing numbers and maths. So um, South African sign uh, encompasses all of that. And I've given you a website over there that you can have a look at if you want to know something more about South African Sign Language, S-A-S-L. So those are the two extremes of the continuum of communication. But within uh, that range, there is a whole variety of things, uh, communication methods that people can use. So the method called total communication, this approach encourages using any means of communication to learn and it recognizes that there are varying different degrees of deafness and the impact that hearing loss has on a child's development and language varies. So the, uh, the approach here would be that children can communicate in sign or lip reading or gestures, whatever uh, suits them the, the easiest at that particular stage and depending on their levels of um, hearing loss. Then the, there is also an approach called sign supported English. And here in this approach, signs are used simultaneously with whichever language it is. It doesn't have to be English. It can be sign-supported Zulu or Afrikaans, any other language. And in order for this to be effective, the person needs to be proficient at both sign and the particular spoken language. However, um, this does have complications and so often um, words will need to be or phrases that in English will need to be um, spelt out with the alphabet signs one, one by one and um, the grammatical structures are different so it's often very complicated for someone to be able to um, sign in a particular a language. Then the next approach for um, a method of communication is called bilingual bicultural approach. And this approach encourages a, an immersion, a competency in both the uh, language of the deaf sign language and the home language of the family that the child belongs to. So sign would become the first language mainly used for communication. So the child becomes part of the deaf culture and community. And the deaf, spelled with a capital D, has its own history and art and stories. And so the child then would learn um, the spoken language as the second language. And I've just used English, but it could be any other language here. So the uh, use of English here would be to become part of the family culture of the child's um, 
family of origin and it's also the language that would be used for reading and for writing and for learning in. So essay sign language would be the first language, the main way of communicating and any other spoken language would be for um, the writing and the reading of that language. So this is a very popular approach. It allows the child to be part of the deaf culture and deaf community and also part of their own family culture at the same time. So um, the child is, is included in all spheres and so their experience becomes much more rich and they are able to um, uh, achieve their own levels of development. So the next thing, uh, major decisions that need to be made are looking at the educational options when one is educating a person who has a hearing impairment. So on this slide, there is a picture of a child who has a cochlear implant. So this means that the hearing loss was severe and the um, implant is uh, amplifying the sounds directly into the cochlea. Okay, but to get back to educational options in South Africa, we have a, um, at the last count, um, there were 44 schools specializing uh, for deaf children. So these are schools where everyone is communicating in South African Sign Language as the official home language and the children would be writing their um, exam in that and they are also simultaneously learning English for reading and writing and in a special school for the deaf it becomes relatively easy for the child to be socialized and integrated into the deaf culture and the activities associated with um, the deaf world. The other option is to look at full service schools and we have full service schools in all the provinces in the country and these are schools that specialize in um, any kind of disability that is generally mild or moderate and so these would be for children who are hard of hearing for children who are, have partial hearing loss um, and so these children would be the, 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 the main language of teaching and learning would be, the, would be English or whichever the home language is but these children would then need to have the oral approach, oralism. So they would be lip reading, they would have hearing aids to amplify the sounds and they would be um, learning English as for reading and writing. However, in this approach, it would be difficult to socialize and to be integrated into the deaf culture and community simply because the child is not part of that community on an everyday basis. And we need in these schools, we need special dedicated teacher teams so the school-based support teams are usually very good at supporting these learners and helping them. So uh, full service schools can certainly cater for children who are hard of hearing depending on the severity of the, the, the loss, the hearing loss and if the child is able to access the curriculum in that particular school. So if we have a look at the things that teachers need to do, one of the key things uh, for educators is to be aware that children with auditory impairments might be in your classroom and these impairments might not have been picked up um, in babyhood. So if an impairment is um, developing, it is acquired, the child is um, already at school 
And so now we're sitting as a teacher with a child in school. One of the things that as educators we need to be able to do is to identify some of the signs that they are that, that, that children exhibit when they are developing a hearing loss. So I have given you here a checklist of some of the things that one can look at and be aware of as a teacher that children who are displaying these things might be showing some kind of, of hearing impairment. And so uh, we would look to see how children respond to social conversations, to giving instructions, um, to noises and sounds around them. Are they hearing things? Are they hearing the teacher's voice and the school bell? Are they turning the volume up on various um, equipment? Are they able to differentiate a voice, uh, the teacher's voice from the noisy background in the classroom? Uh, do these children have difficulty with speech? Often an indicator of an auditory impairment is that the child's speech is problematic. So they could be mispronouncing words, um, the speech could be slow and monotonous um, or very soft or very loud. So the person is not getting adequate feedback into their ears as to how they are speaking, so their speech becomes um, problematic. And then difficulties with discriminating between similar sounds, such as p and b, and difficulties discriminating between similar words, because the um, auditory impairment, the, the little hair nerves might not be picking up these fine sounds so clearly. And then all of these things can um, cause that the child appears to be inattentive and daydreaming, and it can appear uh, the child can be become disruptive and um, restless and frustrated because they can't hear what's happening and they can't take part in quick conversations and the quick things that are happening in the classroom. So. Please have a look at um, this list of some of the signs to look for when we are uh, when, when when teachers are um, teaching, and so if children exhibit uh, stirs, you know at least a couple of these things, uh, then there could be reason to refer the child. So what happens? When we are supporting learners with auditory impairments in our classrooms, the first thing is we are identifying that there is a problem, and there I've given you the checklist, and then one refers the child to a medical doctor or an audiologist or to the school for the deaf. Obviously, all of these referrals take place with, uh, with the parents, so parent consultations are very important. And one works through the school-based support team. So there's a team of people at each school called the school-based support team, and their role is to assist educators in classrooms with managing any um, difficulties that learners are experiencing and with consulting with the parents and deciding the best thing is for that particular child. So if at any stage you happen to find yourselves teaching in a special school for the deaf or in a full service school or in a mainstream school where there are learners with partial hearing impairments, there are various things that um, educators can do in order to support these learners. And I'm going to run through some of the things now. So um, if the child is wearing a hearing aid, it's, it's a useful thing to know that they have you know, a hearing aid um, and that checking that the hearing aid is in working order or the batteries charged 
and also to reduce any background noises and loud distractions. Remember the hearing aid is amplifying the sounds. So if um, a very big loud sound happens, that also gets amplified and that can be quite, be, can be quite um, painful and distracting for the child. So um, one of the key things for teachers to do is to focus on visual information. So to ensure that the child is seeing the teacher's face when she's speaking. This is called face directedness. Uh, the child is um, getting a lot of their information about your communication from either lip reading or lip reading and watching expressions and gestures. And so teachers are encouraged to speak normally, but to speak clearly and to ensure that they are um, standing with the light on their face, not standing with light behind their faces, so that the child can see and then pick up as much information um, about the communication as they can. And then having a print classroom is useful for all children, not only children who have hearing impairments. Uh, having lots of posters and pictures and um, things that are describing the, the, the content of whichever lessons are happening and putting labels onto objects that children would need is a useful thing so that um, children uh, will, will know where all the things are in the classroom and also help to learn the language. So I want to go on and speak about other classroom adaptations that can take place. And one of them is preferential seating. So children who have a hearing impairment will um, be more comfortable sitting in a specific place in the classroom. And that place might be in the front, it might be to one side of the classroom. For instance, if a learner has a cochlear implant in one ear and the other ear um, is not hearing so well, they might prefer to sit where the, um, their best ear is facing the majority of the class or the teacher. Another option with preferential um, seating arrangements is to ensure that your desks are in a, a, a group arrangement or a semicircle or a circle arrangement so that um, children can see each other's lips and facial expressions when they are communicating with each other in group work. So sitting in a, in a row where the child cannot um, see other children's faces is problematic for any kind of um, communication in the classroom. So have a um, be aware of the way that your desks are arranged in a classroom that this has an impact on um, how children are communicating with each other. Then uh, having a support uh, system of socialization, and it's often called a buddy system, where children are paired up with other children to um, help them with any work that needs to be done is a useful strategy in a classroom. And so one can have um, a, a person, a, another child who's allocated to help the child with um, which books they need to get out or what page to turn to for the exercise and so on. And all of this also is to help socialization and making friends and ensuring that the child is included in the activities happening in the classroom. Then um, there are specialized hearing assistive technologies that can be implemented. And these you will often find in special schools because these are the schools that are investing in this technology. 
And so um, there's a, a, a CAD system, which stands for Classroom Audio Distribution System. And this is a, uh, a system where the teacher's voice is amplified in a microphone and so uh, her voice is made louder in the classroom. So it's like a, a microphone system. And this system is useful for all the learners in the classroom because they will all be benefiting from the teacher's voice being loud and clear and the, we know from research into these systems that it reduces the vocal strain that the teachers um, undergo and also they don't have to repeat things in the classroom so many times. So there's a decreased number of um, times that you say an instruction um, allowed. So that is a system that benefits all children in the classroom. Then there are um, specialized amplification devices called personal frequency modulation systems or FM systems, frequency modulation. And these systems are um, designed for individual learners. So there would be a microphone that the teacher can speak into and a little receiver um, attached to the child, um, which um, sends the teacher's voice directly into the, that child's ears or directly into their hearing aid. So this effectively means that that particular child is hearing the teacher as though they were right close next to them. And um, this is really good if there are noisy classes and so the child with the, um, the hearing impairment will be hearing the teacher teacher's voice um, amplified directly close to them. And um, these FM systems can also be used for personal and home use for the child uh, when, they, when they are just um, having to listen to conversations at home and speak with people as they are going in, in their homes. So there's another um, system of communication, which I would like to speak to you about. Um, and this is a, um, a very broad term. It's called augmentative and alternative communication systems. And AAC generally covers all the um, signing and the uh, in, in any form of communication um, to support the spoken word. So any people who have um, e uh, expressive language impairments, so not only auditory impairments, people who have expressive language problems could include children with autism, children with cerebral palsy, where they have difficulty making the sounds with their tongue, um, children with intellectual disability, people who've had stroke or head injuries, any person who is having difficulty with expressive communication can use AAC as a, a supplementary or complementary uh, communication to um, assist them. So it, it, it helps in communicating one's needs and um, wants. So there are two kinds of AAC, unaided. So this is where one is using non-spoken um, symbols with your hands and your gestures and your facial expressions and your body language and of course South African sign language so any of the signing and um, people will um, know all about signs uh, because we we are using gestures every day so we are we are doing unaided AAC when we are communicating with people, even don't have um, 
any kind of expressive language impairment. But for people who have severe and significant difficulties with communicating, they might also need an aided mode of communication. And these are various different devices that can um, assist learners. There are, um, there are devices that are on one's computer and one gets special little tablet devices which will have these symbols on them. So I've given you two picture examples there of the kinds of symbols that could be available. And there are many, many, many different symbols. So these little drawings or pictures, um, are some, um, some, it's a symbolic communication system. They are, there are two main kinds that I know of. One of them is PECS which stands for Picture Exchange Communication System. And the other one is Board Maker. So you can Google PIX and Board Maker um, as AAC, and you will see lots and lots of different um, images for everything, um, all that one might want to communicate about. There are symbols for those things. So I've given you the symbols there for what could happen in a meal time sequence um, that you have to cook the meal and uh, set the table and then eat and then wash up and so on. And um, there's another set of symbols there for when children are exposed to violence and hitting and, um, uh, and social behavior. So you can use these symbols to teach learners um, all the things that um, help with uh, socialization as well. And then the picture on the left hand side is of a, um, a device that is a little booklet that comes with um, little cards and each of the card has cards have a symbol on them and a strip of Velcro so the child can pick up the cards and um, communicate with the teacher or parent or someone around them um, via their symbols without having to speak the words. So um, there's a little helping hand and the child can say, I want help, uh, or whichever symbol it is that they pick up in, from, from their little book uh, of symbols. So the, um, the devices are uh, simple devices like that and then there are all sorts of symbols that come uh, on computers and on little um, handheld devices like tablet type devices that learners can carry around with them and one can teach these symbols from very young um, and then the symbols can get more and more complicated as the child language grows and as the child gets um, uh, more proficient at different languages. So there are also some computers and devices where they will generate speech. So the child will click on the symbols and make a sentence and the device will actually speak um, through recorded uh, digitized speech that the, the, it will speak the words that the child wanted spoken. And so that um, allows a person who has some kind of expressive language impairment to uh, be part of a, um, a spoken, spoken world and, and help with society. Um, so that's AAC. To go on now to two more items, and the next one is the use of a very um, clever little device for um, for assisting children with hearing, and this is called a whisper phone. So a whisper phone is a very simple little um, 
shopping. You can um, buy expensive ones from specialized um, educational shops, but you can also make one out of some um, that the, the, these are plastic um, plumbing pipes that one uses for plumbing, and you get a little um, flat piece and two um, little round edges and put them together, and one makes a an uh, amplifier that the child reads into. So this is a device that I think every child who is learning to read in all foundation classrooms should be using when they are reading um, to themselves. So you read aloud, and what it does is it amplifies the child's um, sounds that they're reading into their own ears so they get the proper feedback. And this assists with reading oral, with oral reading so that your reading becomes more fluent and so the child builds their um, self-esteem because they can, they're getting feedback much um, clearer and more amplified uh, of what they are reading. So it's not um, for the teacher to hear so much as for the child's own feedback to hear. So please um, think about making some whisper phones for your own classrooms when you are teaching children reading skills. And then we need to consider how we assess children who have hearing impairments. So when we are doing any um, accommodations to assessment uh, methods, the way that we are asking children to show us what they have learned, we call them assessment accommodations. So these are um, ways that we are changing the normal assessment from, let's say, pen and paper, where the child has to, has to um, do normal speech, to something that is useful for the child who has a hard, who has a difficulty hearing. So one can use an interpreter who, who interprets sign language for the child, should that be needed. But often what is happening is that children would get additional time and they, get, they should be getting their instructions in sign language or written down or with visual clues or with picture communication symbols um, or written. Um, so that they can easily understand what the what the things are in the test. And we can also have accommodations where children are able to show us what they know by signing what they know and recording this, their answers in sign on a little video and one has cell phones that are able to do all these things nowadays. So there's, um, there are different ways that children can show us what they have learned. And all of these are called accommodations. So there are accommodations that can be made for the final matric exams. And these accommodations need to be applied for way in advance. And the child, there's a formal process where uh, medical doctors um, roots on the medical conditions and various forms need to be filled in that go to the district offices. So anyone who is working in a school, you need to be aware that there are formal processes for obtaining accommodations that happen at uh, formal test times and formal exam times. So learners can be assisted and they can be helped, um, not only when, when you're teaching, but also in the, the assessment process as well. So please have a look for more information at disabilyinfosa.co.za. 
There um, is also lots of information at Deaf South Africa. And if you um, Google anything about hearing impairments, there are lots of websites supporting teachers and parents who have children who have some kind of hearing impairment. So that's all that I have on that topic for now. Please um, stay in touch with the tutor. And if you have any queries or discussions, things that you'd like to speak to me about, put it in the discussion board that is available in this unit. So goodbye for now. And we will um, chat again later when we go on to the next unit.